Hey everyone, this is Steve from GamersNexus.net and we are here with a lot of computer components. Not a surprise given the content of this channel. Today we are building a budget AMD gaming PC. Quick note before we get started, I'm giving away an Antec 1250 liquid cooler. It is a dual pump liquid cooler. Subscribe to the channel for info on that and check back for the video that details the giveaway and how the process will work. If you need a liquid cooler, it's a pretty good way to get a free one. So, uh, moving on, this is actually an entry-level overclocking PC. If you want to do a little bit more than gaming, you want to actually pump up those clocks on the CPU, maybe play around with RAM and the GPU a little bit, this is the system that we've spec'd out for that. It is about $700 for all these parts. You could go for Intel in this price range, but you'd be dropping your GPU a little bit and some of your other components a little bit. And I wanted to have some fun with the overclocking. I know a lot of you are interested in it. And of course, graphics are pretty important, so we wanted more money to borrow from the CPU budget and put into the GPU budget, and that's what we've done here. So let me run you through the parts, and in this guide, I'll show you how to overclock this exact system. And we're using an aftermarket CPU cooler, of course, to do that. So that's what this guide will cover. I'll also run through game benchmarks in the end. Hit links in the description below for all of the content and all of the charts for the benchmarks if you are curious about how this performs in specific games like Battlefield 4 and whatever. So here's what we've got. For the CPU, we've got an AMD Athlon X4 760K. Now, some of you may know the Athlon line from way back <laughs> during the X64 days uh, when they were first starting. This is AMD's new Athlon, which is basically just an APU with no IGP. So they've dropped the graphics chip on the APU on the Richland APUs to be exact and we've just got a CPU in there. So it's just a CPU on the die, and, uh, and because it is Richland, that means it's going to perform a little bit better on the CPU side than Kaveri does. Kaveri does better with the GPU. We don't want that. We've got a discrete graphics card. And so what we have here for the video card is an MSI uh, Twin Frozer Edition R9 270. You can actually get a 280 for about the same price now. They just dropped it a couple days ago. That's about $170 to $190. The CPU is $80, pretty pretty good steal there. For the motherboard, we're putting the CPU and everything else into. We've got an AMD, of course, A88X G45 gaming motherboard from MSI. And because it is an A88X chipset, it's actually going to work with both FM2 and FM2 Plus CPUs. So if you wanted to drop a Kaveri, APU in there, you could totally do that. Uh, it's not going to give you any huge advantages over A85X because with Richland we can't take advantage of PCI E Gen 3, but that's irrelevant for these purposes. You're not going to exceed the bandwidth of Gen 2 anyway, so don't worry about that. It will support two video cards in X8, X8 if you want to do Crossfire or SLI, that is an opportunity there. And it overclocks memory up to 2400 megahertz, which is a chipset and platform limitation. So not crazy high, but not bad, you're not going to need more than 1600 anyway for gaming. So moving on to the power supply, everything is being powered by a, uh, a Rosewill 550 watt PSU. It is a bronze rated PSU. This was actually bundled with the case here and that, that bundle deal is pretty good. I think it's like 15 or $25 cheaper than normally if you buy them separately. So that's on Newegg links again below in the article. The case is a Thermaltake G41 Commander case. So uh, that's it's, it's just a cheap mid tower. It's a budget case. It has a 120 millimeter fan in the back, 120 in the front. You can easily drop more uh, bigger fans too in, in the top and in the bottom if you want more cooling or need it for our purposes. Not so much, we'll be fine with that CPU cooler uh, unless your room runs pretty hot or you're overclocking your GPU as well. So that's the case. It has a little bit of kale management room in the back. I'll show you all that. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff, not, not too crazy. For drives, we have uh, technically this build I'm specking with a one terabyte Western Digital Blue Drive because that's all you need. It's 7200 RPM, that's what you want for gaming. If you want an SSD, you can get like a 240 gigabyte one for 90 bucks right now. Crazy good deal. I would highly recommend it. For budget purposes, we're sticking with a 7200 RPM one terabyte drive. Technically, you'll see a green WD ter or two terabyte drive over there as well. That's because I'm building a system for a very piratical friend. Uh, shout out to Atwem. So, so that's what we've got here for RAM and the optical drive, of course, the most important component. Uh, RAM is two sticks of four gigabyte Kingston HyperX RAM. I believe it is their Genesis line, and uh, pretty good stuff. It's it's uh, clocked at like 1600 or 1866, something like that, and we can very easily overclock it. Not too expensive, and gets the job done for gaming. 
and reliable. So then the optical drive, standard 24X, don't even, I mean, if you're not going to use it, if you can install Windows with a USB key, do it and forget the optical drive. Uh, save you, that'll save you 20 bucks. Then we've got the CPU cooler, which of course is going on our $80 overclocked CPU. So this is a Fantex uh, PH12DX or TC12DX, I think that's what it's called. It's a very user-friendly name, as you can notice uh, when the hardware reviewer can't even remember it. It is the TC12DX, and this ships, it's pretty cool, it ships in red, silver, blue, and black. And I, I think it's nickel-plated, it uses uh, just normal paint for the for the actual fins it won't impact your performance all that much but it looks pretty damn cool if you want something red or blue or whatever so that's what we have there it's four uh, six millimeter heat pipes pretty standard stuff direct contact and um, yeah just just a CPU cooler right it's a pretty decent air cooler if you want air if you want liquid I would not recommend getting into it unless you're spending about 80 plus dollars because any of the cheap liquid coolers are gonna perform worse and louder than a high-end air cooler and those will be priced the same so those are my thoughts there now if you're not sure how to build a computer you haven't done it before hit the link in the description below or I'll pop it up right in front of me here in the video that is a guide on how to build a computer it's not the same spec but it's the same exact process so check that out and that'll help you get the system together and up and running but let's jump into this build I'll, I'll kind of speed through building it and then I'll show you how to overclock the system run through the game benchmarks and we'll be done now in terms of the actual build process for this, it's pretty standard. You can check out my other tutorial video on how to build a gaming computer if you need help actually assembling this. But in, in this specific scenario, the only thing I'd really advise you to do especially is to route the uh, fan cable for the rear fan under the video card before you install it. Plug it in at the bottom of the board and that frees up your uh, fan slot on the right side of the board if you want to install an additional top fan as I've done here for top intake because the overclock was pushing it a couple degrees too high so this cooled it down to a point where I felt comfortable with it. Now that we've got the system built we are ready to overclock. As I mentioned this is a beginner level overclocking system. It's pretty straightforward what we're going to do today. Nothing too special because uh, I, I really would advise you to play around and read a lot before you start tweaking the more advanced settings and BIOS. So what we're starting with here today is just going to be multiplier control and then in uh, in the actual OS we'll mess around with MSI Afterburner to play with the video card settings. So here we've got MSI's BIOS open. This is UEFI BIOS of course so it is mouse enabled. It is pretty fancy on the graphics front. Not, not anything like the old blue and white 8 or 16 bit BIOS we used to have. So what you need to do first is open up this OC tab on the left. You'll start on settings and there's also OC. Uh, before you install your OS you probably want to go to settings and go through to advanced and then integrated peripherals and just make sure you're on AHCI mode for the SATA mode because that's that's what we want to install on. It is It should be like that by default but just uh, out of habit I always do that. So make sure in the top left that OC Genie is currently off. That is MSI's auto overclocking feature. You can use it if you'd like to get a baseline but uh, we're going to play around with this manually so we can learn some more. Click on the OC tab you'll see the CPU base frequency is set to 100 megahertz and uh, then if you look down below adjusted CPU ratio which is set to auto right now if you look below that you should see 3800 megahertz which is 3.8 gigahertz the stock frequency that the processor you purchased ships at if you got the 760k so what we're gonna do here is play around with the multiplier and that's all that's going on behind the scenes right now at a 100 megahertz base clock BCLK with a 3.8 gigahertz total frequency, we're multiplying it by 38x right now. So if we type in 38 and adjust CPU ratio, you will see that nothing changes because all we've done is turn auto off and set it to the setting it was on already. What we can do is increment this slowly to higher multipliers and hope that the CPU remains stable with a higher clock rate. So uh, I normally suggest just jumping straight to 40 or 41 because that's not too huge of an overclock so it should remain stable and it'll get you through those first steps a little bit easier. So we're going to jump to uh, 41 because I've already tested and this is stable at 41 which is 4.1 gigahertz. And if you want to try and step higher you might want to start running liquid once you hit the, the 4.2 to 4.5 gigahertz range because the CPU does run a little bit hot and it's very hard to find accurate measurement software unfortunately. 
So we're at 41 right now, that's 4.1 gigahertz. You don't have to adjust the north bridge ratio. You don't have to really adjust anything at this point. You don't even need to change voltage for the CPU because we're not pushing it that hard. But of course, if we started pushing up the frequency a little bit higher, maybe to the 45 uh, multiplier range, then you probably will need to start changing the voltage to make sure the CPU remains stable. Just check the maximum voltage recommended by AMD so you don't push it too high and, and melt things. Uh, by the way, check out my overclocking primer video for GPU and CPU overclocking. It's a bit more in depth than this will be. This is kind of a crash course. So check those if you want more details on what all these items and BIOS do, because it, it does get pretty advanced if you want to get more extreme with your overclocks. So starting out, uh, you need to make sure your memory is configured properly. It'll probably be 1333 or 1600 by default, but the memory that we purchased is actually a bit more capable than that. So this board has Intel's XMP profiling built into it so we can say enable XMP and you can choose profile 1 or profile 2. Profile 1 will have slightly higher cast latencies or cast timings but it's it's faster in the frequency department it's 1866 megahertz with a 10 cast latency and profile 2 is 1600 megahertz with a 99927 latency so it's a, it's a bit faster in terms of latency but slower in frequency I, I'm just using Profile 1 right now, honestly, this isn't going to have a huge impact on your gaming performance, but why not boost it above the 1333 or 1600 default, right? So we'll push it to 1866 with Profile 1, and at this point we're pretty much done. We've got our basic overclock dialed in, we have our RAM set to what it should be, so we can hit F10 to save and exit, and now the system's going to boot normally into Windows. Once you're in Windows, you want to download MSI Afterburner, and that is going to be used for overclocking the GPU and also monitoring the GPU temperatures. But before actually tweaking the GPU, we need to make sure that the CPU overclock we've just set is stable. So the best way to do that is grab Hardware Monitor, that's HW Monitor, and that will let us monitor the CPU temperatures. Unfortunately, there's not an accurate measurement tool for any of these modern AMD CPUs. I don't know why that is. Uh, they're all going to measure a lot hotter than the CPU actually is, but hardware monitor is the most accurate I've found. So grab that, then grab Prime95. It can be found on the interwebs if you type in Prime95, and I have a guide on using that as well in our overclocking primer I've already mentioned. So grab Prime95, Prime run hardware monitor, and then tell Prime95 to run LFFTs, large FFTs, and that's going to really strain the CPU and not much else. So. You want to run that for, uh, if you make it to the 15 minute mark, it's probably going to be fairly stable. So uh, I would really start with just go to 15 minutes, make sure it's stable. If you want to try and push the clocks a little bit more, go for it. But watch that hardware monitor temperature the whole time. Make sure you're not exceeding anything dangerous. I was sitting at around 77C, which sounds hot, but again, this is, is not an accurate measurement tool. So uh, 77C was, was what it was measuring at with the stock installation with an aftermarket cooler. When I overclocked it was sitting around 83C, so that's about 5 to 6 Celsius warmer. Not too terribly much. Uh, it is quite warm, but again, we have measurement issues in terms of accuracy, so not too bad overall to get 6C warmer with that uh, extra couple hundred megahertz boost to the frequency. So as you're measuring temps, just make sure it stays kind of on the on the safe side and let it run for 15 minutes at first, reboot up the frequency if you really want to, if you feel confident, and if you have a liquid cooler probably, and, uh, and then do that until you get crashes or blue screens. Don't ever let it exceed anything like 90 Celsius, 95 Celsius. That's getting the danger zone, especially since uh, TJ Maxx on these AMD CPUs is technically, I believe 75 or 80 Celsius. Richland is a bit warmer, but I've said it a thousand times now, it all comes down to measurement tools. So. Um, so that's, that's the need to know information on CPU overclocking. Run Prime95 with LFFTs for as long as you think is reasonable, a couple of hours ideally, uh, once you have a frequency you're happy with, just to make sure it remains stable. And then jump into MSI Afterburner, and with Afterburner, we can adjust the GPU settings to get a, a tiny bit of a GPU overclock. You can't overclock GPUs to the same capacity as CPUs because they function differently. So. The stock setting here in Afterburner is 955 megahertz for the core clock. We're going to adjust that pretty comfortably to 995. That is about a 40 megahertz overclock 
and uh, and that'll that'll push us a couple extra frames if we're lucky, depending on the game. And it's not going to be uh, unstable. So set set that 995 megahertz overclock. You might want to step it up more gradually than that. I stepped it up 20 megahertz at a time, so I did two increments of 20 before I found this to be stable and safe. And then run Furmark uh, with the Burnin 1080p test and run that, let it run its course. If it crashes, you've gone too far, you need to back off that throttle a little bit. If it doesn't crash, you're good, probably leave it where it is and don't play with it too much. Uh, don't touch the voltage unless you know what you're doing. And the memory clock is nice to, to jump up, but it's not going to really push a whole lot of extra frames in your performance in gaming. But um, you can read my full guide on overclocking for more information on all of that. So what does this gain us? Well, in the real world, I got about a 10 FPS boost in average FPS in Battlefield 4. That's a pretty significant boost. That put us from about 40 FPS to about 50 FPS. And if you drop some of the Battlefield settings, it's the difference between 50 and 60 FPS, which is very smooth gameplay on a 60 hertz monitor to pretty average gameplay. So that's Battlefield. In Metro Last Light, I saw almost no difference in the average FPS. It was very small. However, the 1% low FPS, which would be your lag spikes, we call them, graphic spikes, that department was about 5 to 10 FPS better with the overclock, so that's fairly significant. That means your spikes will be much less uh, impacting to your ability to aim and, and play the game. And then the Total War series I used as a CPU benchmark, almost no difference across the board. It was pretty flat, so you're not going to see a lot of difference there. Just goes to show that it all depends on how the game is optimized and built. So that's everything you need to know about this system. If you need help building this, post a comment on the article. Uh, I don't hit the YouTube comments too much anymore, but post a comment on the article linked in the description below. All of the parts for this build are linked in the description below. And let me know if you need help. We will see you all next time. Peace.